So what's disconcerting about proving Kepler's first law is that the calculus we use is polar coordinates, not x, y, z calculus. And this makes it a little bit harder for you to read because you generally have done very little, if any, calculus in polar coordinates. And that's not to pick on you, it's just how it is. So if we take a situation and uh, those are your two basic coordinates. And remember the unit circle is it's a distance on the unit circle that is your angle in radians. So this is not elliptical. It doesn't matter what the shape of the orbit is. It's going to be hyperbola, anything. It's still, it'll track faster or slower on the unit circle. I will give you that. It doesn't change anything. So what we know is that based on the mass, there is forces this way, but there's no force on the unit toward on the tangent to the unit circle. So from uh, Newton, we have a force equal to some constant times the mass over r squared times r hat. And we all know the hat is the unit vector, right? And also This force is along the R. There's no force uh, tangent <clears throat> to the inner circle. So using vector addition, equal to the force we have m a r r hat plus m a theta theta hat even though we know it to be zero that's still true okay we also know that m a r zero is equal to negative k m over r squared and that's big m actually so we should just, that's it. we don't care about the mass of the little guy, just call this M here. And M A theta will equal zero. And that's our initial set of conditions. And we want to figure out what, what, we, can, what we can do about this and arrive at a deduction about the shape of the orbit. So let's first make sure we understand what we're trying to accomplish here. <clears throat> so we seek uh, information on all constraints on the shape. of the order. This requires an expression of R as a function of theta. 
theta. That's going to give us geometry. Okay? So this is irrespective of the position of the orbiting object. We're going to do the math on this, and we aren't going to care where the damn thing is. What we care about is what's the shape of this orbit. Now, the orbit shape could well be, just as an example, okay, let's put possible shape. So we have to understand, so we want to be clear, star not r of t, theta of t. And it's easy to fall into the trap of solving for those two. So we always have to keep our eye on the prize. And the prize is, what is, Kepler says all orbits are conic sections, so therefore we need an equation as a function that describes the shape of the orbit, not its dynamical situation. So this is um, a honeypot here we have to be careful of. So initially, r hat is equal to cos theta sine theta, and theta hat will equal <clears throat> minus sine theta cos. And we already did this, if you will, when we did circular motion, and it's the same logic. We're just taking the derivative, um, but in effect you're rotating at 90 degrees, which gives you the same result. So now, we have to think about this a little bit. So we're still dealing with unit vectors here, initially. And so what we're going to say here is then r dot hat is equal to dr hat dt, which is then equal to dr hat dr, I should use partial derivatives here, but I won't, dr dt. <coughs> plus dr hat d theta, d theta dt. Let's go back and look at this. So in effect, <clears throat> how is this changing with respect to r? And we'll look and see what we get here. Because it helps a little bit with the calculus. So now, evaluating, we're going to say, okay, in this term here, how much is the length of a unit vector changing with respect to the length of the vector, based on what you know? Can we rephrase this? How much does the length of a unit vector change? Zero. So we're all set there. So this is going to be zero times r naught because dr dt is just r dot, by definition, right? And then when you go over here, plus, <clears throat> and then, dr hat d theta, we go over here, and take the derivative of these two elements with respect to theta, what do we get? Theta hat. So this is going to be theta hat, theta dot. Everybody follow me on okay. It's great fun, isn't this? Hey, Sophie? Yeah. I love it. You guys can lie. You don't even feel bad. It's just great. Okay. Now let's do theta dot hat. And this is equal to uh, d theta hat dp. 
is equal to d theta hat dr dr dt plus d theta hat d theta d theta dt. Very similar to the previous one. So let's look and see where we come out of this. How much does the unit vector theta change with the length of the vector r? How long, how much do unit vectors change? So that's easy. So once again, we have zero r dot. Plus, now we take this one. I take the derivative. Take the derivative here. We're going to get negative cos negative sine. And what's that? Negative r hat. Right? So we'll just minus this instead. Say negative r hat theta dot. Alright. Let's have a look now. Turn the page. Since the vector r is equal to r times r hat by definition, then then the r dt is equal to the r dt chain rule again. R hat plus r dr hat dt. Right? just a chain rule, <clears throat> and because everything's dynamic, you have to chain rule everything, you can't assume anything's a constant. Because although r hat is a constant in length, it's not a constant in direction, that's for sure. So we have to be careful. <clears throat> so then we look at this, well, the RDT is V, which is equal to R dot, which is equal to And this is the RGT as a vector, where this is just the magnitude, right? So we've got to be a little careful about that. So let's use V as a vector here. Let's rub that out. And then we'll say R dot, R hat, plus R. And then we've got <clears throat> this one, right? Because if we say uh, we have dr hat dt, we're going to have r dot hat, right? Just by definition. And we know what r dot hat is. It's this. <clears throat> so then we will say plus r times, and then we ignore the first term because it doesn't matter, theta hat, theta dot. <clears throat> And then, for acceleration, acceleration is equal to dv dt. And I should point out here that this is a legitimate vector. You have a unit vector here in r and a unit vector here in theta. So you rearrange, this is still a difference equation, but you can rearrange. Ultimately, you could have stuff in terms of r hat and stuff in terms of r theta. And if we get rid of the derivatives by solving the differential equation, then we are, we're where we need to be. We just have to change it into geometry. <clears throat> VDT is equal to VDT of all of this. <clears throat> so R dot R hat plus R theta dot theta hat. So now a whole bunch of product rules. So let's see, we've got A is equal to R double dot R hat plus R dot R dot hat 
And don't get too fancy about substituting just yet. Just do it straight and then do the next line where you substitute what we know over here. Uh, plus r dot theta dot theta hat plus r theta double dot theta hat plus r dot, sorry, r theta dot, pardon me, theta dot hat. So a bunch of product rules there. If you have a multiplication of three, you just do the distributive law. And then we're going to have r double dot theta r hat plus r dot quantity theta dot theta hat plus r dot theta dot theta hat, which is fine, plus r theta double dot theta hat, and finally r theta dot quantity negative theta dot r hat. <clears throat> and finally, we have a is equal to, and then we collect terms, we're going to have a is equal to r double dot minus r theta dot squared r hat plus quantity r theta double dot plus 2r dot theta dot quantity theta hat. So what you have here is the acceleration in both directions, the radial direction and the acceleration along the unit circle. Okay? And if you recall the previous board, this is what we were looking for. So AR is now equal to um, R double dot minus R theta dot squared. And that was equal to minus KM over R squared. Or well, don't forget the m, which we do that. K over r squared. So it's, just a, it's a constant, and a constant times a constant is a constant. And a theta is equal to r theta double dot plus 2r dot theta dot equals 0. Which, again, comes from the beginning of the derivation. And we call these equations of motions. And this is, there's two nonlinear DEs here. And they're simultaneous. So you have <clears throat> derivatives multiplied, derivatives squared. Um, this is, this is tall cotton for what we've been doing. However, <clears throat> Uh, in an understatement that previous classes have enjoyed, that normally this would require a computer. that I heard every ever after that anything I did that was complicated one maternity that well due to its simplicity there was a lot of they were quite a group must be half of them must be PhDs now but we are able
uh, to move forward. And this is where we can get into trouble with this notion of solving for uh, theta and r of t versus r of theta. So like, you have to keep your eye on the ball. You are on the prize when you're trying to do these things. Let us consider And I'm going to um, number these two. So we'll call the AR equation 1 and the A theta equation 2. Consider multiplying equation 2 by R. If we do this, we get then R squared <clears throat> theta double dot plus 2r, r dot, theta dot is equal to 0. And this is, once again, a reverse product rule. So, in a completely different context, multiplying by r, r becomes an integrating factor because it helps you integrate. And so we get <clears throat> r squared theta double dot plus 2r r dot theta dot is equal to d dt of r squared theta dot. So, <clears throat> integrating implies that r theta dot equals a constant. Generally we use h. Now this is a verification of Kepler's second law here. And again, because of the limited experience you have with polar coordinates, you don't see it. Measuring the area of a sector So if you make a circle, right, you got the sector is, you know, this, right? So what we're saying is the rate in which the area is swept out, sector area is equal to r squared theta. So the ADP is r squared theta dot. And this is a constant. So it's a proof of So technically, it's r squared theta over 2, but a constant divided by 2 is still a constant, so we can do that either way. So we've got number 2 done in the midst of solving for number 1, which is not a real big surprise. So returning to 1. We might venture to, and I call three, just go from sketcher. Sub, um, this and get theta dot is equal to h over r squared and drop that in equation one here you're going to get rid of the thetas right but you're going to have an r of t equation and that's not the idea I'm oh, sorry not eliminate time part of eliminate theta and this is not the idea
So now r dot is equal to dr to theta, theta dot, and this is equal then to h over r squared dr to theta. And so dr to theta is already there, and we can put h over r squared from equation 3. So this is That's where that comes from. And then we just have to take some derivatives again. And r double dot will equal uh, h times negative 2 over r cubed r dot dr d theta plus 1 over r squared <laughs> d2r d theta squared theta dot. <clears throat> and we can, or we can write this a little differently to our advantage, negative h squared over r squared quantity over r cubed, dr d theta squared, this is quantity squared on that one, minus 1 over r squared, d 2 r d theta squared. So fortuitously, and this is why it's simple, And I suspect because it's a conservative force. So fortuitously, um, all of this becomes d2 theta squared of 1 over r. So that really condenses that, thank you. We'll let u equal 1 over r, and then h double dot is equal to, sorry, r double, pardon me, r double dot is equal to negative h squared u squared du d theta, and that's just a double derivative, second derivative. Turning to one, we substitute, and we get d two mu d theta squared plus mu is equal to k over h squared. Now this is a linear difference equation, we're going to know how to solve this, okay? That's just a second order equation. It's driven, sort of, but it's not that difficult. So, we know uh, mu is equal to k over h squared. <clears throat> Hello? Do you need to know all of this? No, I won't ask you to regurgitate it, no. But I'm going to ask you parts of here and there which would be reasonable for a test. I've shown this to you because it's, it's kind of cool. We're almost done how it works out. And it's a good exercise for you to see how polar coordinates works. And that's why I'm doing it, that's why I do it for you. So I think it's kind of neat. Plus B cos theta minus delta. We're almost done. You just don't realize it. And so B and delta are 
are set by initial conditions. And that's uh, speed and position and stuff like that, where, where it is. So then R becomes equal to quantity K over H squared plus B coast theta minus mu or yeah. and then this is all reciprocal hence R then is equal to and then we can use <coughs> different variables to convert it to the meaningful shapes of the ellipse get this and then I want to show you and this is where it comes from that's a P yes so the centricity E the centricity is equal to <clears throat> VA squared over K and P is simply the reciprocal of B we're just using different variables. And so I want to show you how this plays out. Last panel. Uh, perhaps you're in the same boat I was in the second year. <clears throat> this is the equation of a conic in four coordinates. So now the shape of the conic is simply a function of the eccentricity, be it negative or positive, and whether it's or greater or less than one, whether it's an ellipse or hyperbola, slash circle, slash parabola. And theta, so often we simply write R is equal to EP over 1 plus E cos theta, assuming it starts at the or an arbitrary origin. And <clears throat> this theta is the true anomaly. It's actually uh, new. Because it's how much the, what is the angle on the unit circle uh, in the orbit proper, not, not the circumscribed circle. Not bad work for a guy in 1600 who was sick and uh, with a quill pen and an abacus and, you know, some training and some geometric proofs. You have to understand, of course, in the 16, early 1600s, algebra really hadn't been invented too much. I mean, Descartes largely given credit for that. But there's, you know, there might have been some aspects of it. But uh, it's a pretty amazing piece of work. And uh, so this shows you. So even here... Again, because the preparation that you were generally given is mostly in Cartesian coordinates, recognizing that you've seen a conic here, uh, you almost have to be told that. And that's what I pick on you, that happened to me too in second or third year. And we don't have much feel for working with these things. It's not what we do. Okay? There are different ways to express the conic. They'll cancel this out and cancel out and do some modifications, but it's the same thing. Okay? So... There you go. I took this from Ritger and Rowe. It was written in 1966 when the math books were still math books. Where you simply have the deductions. There's no pictures of mathematicians. It's not in color. But it's, it was one of the better textbooks I used because you get to the point of what you want to learn. Yes, sir? So how do we know that the equals k over h squared plus this? How do I know that? This is, well, this is because this is a solution to a different equation that you theoretically have studied. Yeah, so this is a solving a nonlinear, or sorry, a non-homogeneous second order without damping. And we wouldn't expect damping here, okay? If we have damping coefficient, we're in trouble because the orbit does not decline. And theoretically, it shows that it doesn't, which is kind of cool too. But gravity is a conservative force, which means that the act of using gravity conserves energy. It doesn't, uh, doesn't bleed. Gravity doesn't get tired. Sophie. Where am I looking, sir? 
Okay. Yeah, this mu is equal to one over r up here. You mean? Yeah. It's just a substitution. So, um, uh, Sarah. Is h a defined constant? Yes, it is. It's the constant that comes out of that second law thing, and it's effectively the angular momentum. When you, because you can show, you can mess around and show that r cross v is simply the same thing. <clears throat> and when you show that the sector area is swept out, it can also be shown to be r cross v. Uh, and, and the rate of change of that is constant, uh, then <clears throat> it's just a matter of transformation, but the sector area's uh, swapping, swooping out rate is effectively constant because the angular momentum is constant. You can actually show they're connected. And that's why they use H. R squared omega. R squared omega is the sector area. The rate of it being swept is R squared omega dot. Yeah. And if we're showing that to be constant, so the area is not constant, it's the rate the area is swept up that's the constant. And so, uh, which is the equal areas equal times yeah. arguments that he gets for his second law. That's kind of fun. Um, I, um, I've got um, one other simple one that I might show you too here. This won't keep you too much. To show all orbits are in a plane, that the plane isn't warped if it's a two. I can, it's a one pager, and then we'll call it a. So we do the course, and then once in a while, I like to do a few little extra things here and there to make you aware. Same as later on, if we get time, I'll show you how magnetism really doesn't exist. That's a relativistic effect. And we don't, we don't. I don't evaluate that. But it's kind of cool, and it makes you aware of it because you've written down the derivation. So proof: all orbits are planar. two bodies, all kinds of things can happen. <clears throat> so the force <clears throat> is going to be equal to the magnitude of the force times the unit vector. <clears throat> and R cross F is equal to R cross F R hat, because that's how we defined our force. And this is equal to F times R cross R hat, which will be zero. <clears throat> because the vector, these are vectors are parallel. And let's put here just to remind ourselves, since R is parallel to its own unit vector. Also, F is equal to M R double dot. And <clears throat> uh, R cross m r double dot is equal to 0 is equal to r cross f. <clears throat> because m double, uh, m r double dot is simply just Newton's second law. <clears throat> and ddt of quantity R cross M R dot is equal to uh, zero because of, we can show um, you can do it if you want to. Uh, so we have this would be equal to dr so d dr dt uh, M R hat plus R um, this is a cross. Here, let me do that. Here's a cross. So that makes these two parallel, right? R dot. This is an R dot, and that's an R dot. And then we've got uh, R cross M R double dot. Okay, so this equals zero because R dot is parallel to R dot, and this equals zero because it's shown above. So that clears that up, hopefully. <clears throat> Integrating, well, actually, I can 
go the other way if I want. means that r cross m r dot is equal to some constant, say, h. <clears throat> now, left multiply each side by r dot. <clears throat>